Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Eleanor, and I work for Edinburgh City of Literature Trust. Edinburgh was designated a City of Literature in 2004, and as part of this wonderful designation by UNESCO on our literary city, the Trust take great pride in working with and finding and establishing and encouraging new writers and new voices from our city of Edinburgh. So today I take great pride in introducing our next story shop writer to you. Her name is Heather Parry and she is a writer and editor who in her words has skittered around the world for a few years before settling in Edinburgh. Her work has been published in a number of anthologies and magazines and she's currently writing a novel. She writes about dystopias, utopias and real life which can sometimes be somewhere in between. So please join me in welcoming Heather Parry reading The Skin They're In. <coughs> the Skin They're In. Finn was only four when his sister grew new ears. It was a blue sky seaside afternoon. She crouched by a rock pool looking for starfish and he saw them. Two coarse nubs of dark brown that protruded from the top of her head. Jenny, 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 you've got horns. He reached out to touch one. Don't poke me, Phineas, she scolded, using her mother's full name technique for maximum effect. You've got horns, Jenny. She wafted him away. Their mother called, and they ran to their scuffed Volkswagen. Mummy, Mummy, Jenny's got horns. She's not got horns, she's got head lice said their father, <laughs> dusting sand off the boy's corduroy trousers and lifting him into the car. But their mother had seen them and grasped the girl's head and sifted through the strands of hair trying to see, desperately, where they started, where they'd grown from, and how they might be removed. They massaged her head and bought hats by the handful. They kept her at home after the Easter break. They tried to hold the ears back with headbands and hair clips, but still, the new protrusions grew bigger. They grew greyer. They grew proud. Her human ears shriveled and shrank away to nothing. On the last evening of the holidays, Jenny took her father's straight razor and shaved the sides of her head, leaving the hair on top to cascade down from her new ears and show them off in all their glory. In the morning, her mother rang the school and said that the girl would not be back. That summer, Jenny's face became longer. Her eyes migrated, her teeth stuck out, and she grew fur on every available inch of skin. On the morning she dropped to all fours to walk on her new hooves, no amount of beatings would make her stand back up. When they finally dragged her out of the house, five large men pulling on her bridle, she screeched and brayed and he hawed as she went. Soon enough, New photos filled the living room frames. The second be bedroom was pulled apart piece by piece and put together again as an office for no one. Finn received hundreds of hand-me-downs and there was no more talk of Jenny. Finn was 11 when he began to shed his skin. With familiar rocks beneath his feet, he searched for absent starfish in algae-covered puddles. And as he reached for a baby crab, he saw it. Half his arm, raw as meat, a translucent crust falling sideways. A few days later, he coughed a ball of sodden matter onto his dinner, and when they unfolded it with tweezers, they found it was the shape of his tongue. That night, he scratched at his hairline, and his face came away in his hands, a ghostly facsimile of his features fluttering to the floor. Oh God, said the mother. Get him out, said the father. Finn was silent as they raged against each other, one pleading, the other panicking. The father said he couldn't go through it all again, couldn't watch another child turn into a feral creature. The mother said it was a phase, a turn of the tides, something seasonal perhaps, like heat rash or hay fever. And so, instead of turning the boy out of their lives, they agreed to send him out to a sheltered cove on the beach with a blanket and a bag of sandwiches to see what panned out. He didn't argue. For 40 days, he caught fish and dug holes and watched as flakes of dead flesh fell to the floor. 
And then, finally, it stopped. For six weeks every year, the cave became his haven. He took books and biscuits and bedded down inside the curved rock, a basalt room with an entrance always covered by the lapping waters. There, he didn't need to cover himself in Vaseline or bandage his hands to keep his condition hidden. There, he rolled in the sand to exfoliate himself, hurrying up the process. He couldn't go back home until he was rid of every inch of crust. His father wanted to see nothing less than fresh epidermis from head to toe. Finn picked and pulled and peeled and rubbed himself on the sharp rocks, hoping that every drop of blood would buy him one last night out on the sands. It went on like this until he was 16. His parents explained away his absence with vague mentions of summer camp and sick grandmas and exchange trips to Germany. Still, his mother clung to the hope that he would go back to how he was before. It's just a phase, you're all hormones, she sang. Come 18, you'll be bright as rain again. But Finn had begun to see new things. A hint of blue beneath the first layers of fresh skin. The growing stain of turquoise and gold, the colors of the sea, at the crook of his elbow. The emerging lattice in pale gray that couldn't be explained away as a patchwork of veins. His mother couldn't feel the tightening of his limbs, the changing shape of his tongue, the overwhelming urge to stop bothering with legs altogether. His mother was right, it wouldn't last. But Finn knew that he would never again be the boy he once was. One morning, just after his 17th birthday, he packed his blanket, now threadbare and made of must, wrapped his sandwiches in brown paper and headed off for the beach. The days of his parents waving goodbye were long gone. For an hour, he walked with flaking soles of his feet in the water, the blanket leaving a trail behind him in the wet sand. He peeled his clothes off as soon as he was out of sight of the house. He'd taken to wearing long sleeves and trouser legs to cover up the undeniable hue of his flesh, and he was glad to be rid of the clinging material. When he reached his sanded refuge, he placed his face into the sea and washed off the foundation that he'd begun stealing from his mother. Then he took shelter, squinting in the shade, for each year the sun hurt his eyes just a little bit more. Finn. The sounds were so inhuman that at first he barely heard her. Finn. There she was. Four legs, thick white fur at the end of her snout, and a coarse mane running between those magnificent ears. It was unmistakably Jenny. He knew that she was smiling. He threw himself around her neck and wept into her fur until all the frustration of his existence was almost gone. He stroked her ears and she snorted. He laughed. Together in the sand, they sat watching the seagulls circle and circle and circle and bomb, beaks first, kamikaze, crushing thrown to the wind. Jenny quietly nibbled at his shedding skin, peeling off layer after layer and braying with wonder at the shine of his new skin underneath. The seagulls still dove and emerged, and he envied them. It was hard for Jenny to speak, so he told her stories. He told her about the speech therapist he was secretly seeing to hide his growing lisp. He told her about taking the hems of his trousers up so that his parents wouldn't notice his legs getting shorter. He showed her the ease with which he could dislocate his whole jaw, placing both fists inside his mouth, before willing it back to the way it was without even so much as an ache. For five weeks, they ate fish and crab and wrapped up in each other at night. With Jenny's help, he was freshly skinned and ready to go a full week before his usual time. But as he started to apply his mother's makeup to his face, Jenny pulled her lips back from her teeth and slowly, painfully spoke. There, there's a place for us, she said. There, there are people like us. It's okay. Come with me. You don't have to... She choked on the words, and he held her. He put up a pretense of decision, but he already knew he would go. The pain of hiding in his own home was becoming too much. He no longer fit in the place they'd carved for him. He knew that his legs, eventually, would wither away to nothing, and he would slide on his belly and writhe with freedom and his parents would hate to see it. For a while, he simply stroked Jenny's matted hair 
letting his palm lay heavy all the way down to her nostrils. She closed her eyes and sighed. As the temperature dropped, he folded the blanket, put the makeup on top, and placed the bundle inside the curved rock, hoping that when they came to find him, they would understand. He placed his hand on Jenny's back, and together they walked, not towards their childhood home, but away from it. And as his legs grew heavy and useless, and his feet became entangled and confused, he dropped to his belly and crawled. Thank you very much, Heather. We hear every day a new story from a different writer at three o'clock in the Spiegel Tent, uh, and that will last until next Monday. But it's not next Monday yet, so it's still coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for joining us and for enjoying the story show, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow where you can hear a story from Anakin Bloomberg. Thank you very much.